It was a normal Friday. It was at nighttime. We hadn't had dinner yet. I was hungry. The TV was on. It was a reality show. Jack was in the hallway. I can see him from where I was laying on the floor. And all of a sudden, They barged in with guns. I was so scared, I couldn't speak. The cops threatened my dad that they would shoot him. And one of the cops put his knee in my dad's back. My dad comes in handcuffs. And me and my brother were screaming, don't shoot my dad, don't take my dad. They searched the bathroom and they flipped the mattress. When my mom grabbed the search warrant, she looked at the names. That's when she said to the cops in the living room, you have the wrong floor, this is not us. They live upstairs. They live upstairs. I was thinking, why is this happening to us? We were just a happy family. We did not want this. My name is Peter Mendez. I'm 11 years old and I live in Chicago. And I'm in the sixth grade. I used to live at 35th and Damon, and that's where the raid happened. My mom and dad are really the greatest parents ever. <laughs> They're the best parents a kid could ever wish for. My dad works hard. He works as a janitor. My mom, she's a computer person. You want to chop the milk? No. My little brother Jack means the most to me because he looks up to me. He's my baby brother. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a cop. But now that that happened, I kind of don't want to be a cop if that's going to happen to other kids. You're seven years old? Yes. So this was your brother's birthday party? Yes. And how old was he turning? Four. Were you excited for your brother? Yes. Why were you excited? Because at the same time I love cake. Like every time it's on my birthday I get really, <laughs> you know, I, feel, I get really excited. I came to cut cake, you know, um, celebrate, sing happy birthday, show him I love him and bring him a present. So he never got to cut his cake? No. No one got to have that cake? No. And so when the police officer came through this door, what was the police officer doing? Yeah. Pointing the gun? So I thought they were, they were going to shoot me and my brother and everybody else. He's little. Well, and you should not even really see this. What do you see? A lot of police and so many of them. <laughs> like about, oh my God, so many of them. <laughs> they just daddy coming. A lot of them. At that time, I'm looking, thinking it's a joke, you know what I mean? But then you see guns. You see like, <laughs> oh God. You see guns pointed at us. It was like terrifying. I, they didn't. They didn't describe themselves as the police. They did not say who they were. They were like in regular clothes. The whole front room, um, they tore, tossed the couches or, you know, uh, threw the food on the floor, um, tossed his birthday gifts, you know, and just damaged like 
anything they got their hands on, they just flipped. After they left, the cake was on the floor in the corner with the number four stuck down in it. I'm okay. You're hearing this? Yeah, it's just like emotional for my daughter to fully understand and feel the way she feel at just seven years old. So yeah, it's always emotional for me, so I'm sorry. <laughs> She's comforting you right now. Right. <laughs> Should she have had to have gone through something like that? No. And that's her first time ever experiencing things like that. And I'm so surprised and proud of her that she's taken it well better than me. And I'm 33. And it's like, yeah. It's hard for you. Yeah. Knowing your children were put in that position. Yeah. On my son's birthday at that. So, yeah. Thank you, Mama. If the police pointed guns at you during that raid, raise your hand. They had us all run to like a corner of the room. It was in the kitchen though. What were you thinking at that point? I was scared. Did you know what was happening? No. Why do you think the police would point a gun at you? At first, I, I didn't know. The informant told them that he'd been buying heroin out of the second floor apartment mm -hmm. for two months from a guy named Ace, Derek Bell. <laughs> and then nobody stood there but me and my boys. That's why I kept telling them, like, don't nobody stay here but me. So I'm like, who are you looking for? They never told me. I knew they had the wrong apartment when they looked at each other crazy. This is the person police were looking for. Mm -hmm. But no one's ever even seen this guy. Nope. I got more records involved with the raid. Mm -hmm. Took a while, but we got him. The guy that they raided your house looking for, mm -hmm. if they would have done their homework, the guy they were looking for was in prison. Mm -hmm. And he had been in prison since 2009. Rolling. For the last, nearly the last year, we've been investigating wrong raids or raids involving search warrants that had inaccuracies. We want to make sure that we're achieving law enforcement objectives in ways that assure the safety of the officers, but also go, 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 go. Go, in ways that minimize the impact and the footprint of government on the lives of individuals, especially when we're talking about children and certainly in the context of when we're talking about invading people's homes, the very essence of what the Fourth Amendment is about. When your mom told them yeah, you're in the wrong right. apartment, what did they say? Curtis Roberts, they live upstairs. They live upstairs. <laughs> If they already know it's the wrong apartment. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah. Anything back there? Why do they need to search? They kept searching, trying to find something on us. Okay, you okay there? This is not the first time, it's not the last time. They're gonna keep doing it. Anybody can tell you anything off the street. Do you believe everything, you know, a person tells you? My name is Officer Brian Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Star number? 16773. Rank? Police officer. You were really cooperative. Because yeah, I didn't want to get shot. That's the only thing I was worried about. You could see how close that gun was to your face. Yeah. I could see it in the video. So I get to walk into the tour of the door. Mm -hmm. I watch, I walk to the door, it just burst it open. And it just came down the hallway with a shit in the gun. But I knew, like, you got the wrong house. I knew, like, I knew. We have 
here, brother. All right, your leg. Um. Give me your hand. What's your name, young lady? My name is Sean Graham. Okay. This was that officer's first warrant. The one that got the warrant for your mm -hmm. house, that's the first warrant he ever got. He just probably put them out there. This is the audio recorded statement of accused member police officer Brian Collins, star 16773. Prior to the execution of your warrant that day, how many apartments did you believe were on the first floor? One. And did you do a simple internet search of Google or any other internet search engines to confirm the number of units in that building? No. Did you personally conduct any surveillance of this location to ascertain if the alleged transactions were occurring at the rear door and to verify that you had the correct target unit? When I drove by the front and rear of the... But any the surveillance system. after the drive-by? No. It was hard, like, seeing guns right there just pointed in the face. Like, that's how we lost our mother, to gun violence. So it was terrifying. So you still have that emotional scar? Yes. From losing your mom? Yes. When you do lose a family member like that, to gun violence. I'm sorry. I know it's hard. I'm sorry, Nishan. I'm State Senator Jacqueline Collins. I represent the 16th Legislative District. Clear, 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 clear. clear. I think that I'll probably because they know that they're in a certain community uh, where um, they feel they can get away with that kind of behavior. And I think because there's no discipline, there's no follow-up, there should be something in place, a departmental discipline for these violations where people violate, civil rights are violated. I think that is totally unacceptable, it's unconscionable, and that's why we need to get involved in mandating that they, they're held accountable for that misuse of uh, a power, abuse of power. Superintendent, just switch gears for a second. Um, can you talk with us about wrong raids and bad search warrants? Sure. You know, listen, we do thousands of um, search warrants a year, and we do everything we can to ensure that we are uh, targeting the right location. But at the end of the day, you know, we rely on uh, citizens' information most of the time. But we're not perfect. We're human. Sometimes we make mistakes, but we try to provide the officers all the training we can to ensure that that type of thing doesn't are happen. You, are you tracking them? Can, do you know how many times they get it wrong? Yeah, we look at it. Do you have actual numbers? I don't have it off the top of my head, but we do have that. Because we've been asking for numbers. You hit the apartment of the Mendeses, correct? That's correct. Okay. 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 I, know the, I know that it's them upstairs. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Mendez and their children, Peter and Jack, were not the intended targets of your search warrant. Correct? No, they were not. Okay. Can you point to any training in, in your training record, any specific training course in your training record, um, where they taught you that uh, you should find out when kids are likely to not be home and execute the warrant during those times? No. Do you think the police were very, way too rough with you? Yes. I even tried to shake their hands. Two of them just shrugged by. And then one just shook my hand. Because that was the guy that realized that they were in the wrong apartment. We're in the middle of moving. How did it make you feel when the officers wouldn't even shake your hand? I just felt that they're unpolite because you know, I was trying to be nice. It's okay. It's okay, Peter. You're doing a good job. What are you thinking about right now? <laughs> Just the saddest moment. They really hurt you that day. 
What did they make you feel? Mm -hmm. They made me feel like the police weren't even what I thought they were. You had a different image of what a police yeah. officer was. You wanted to be a police officer? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just don't want you anymore. I don't think they're heroes. <laughs> Mayor, what's being done to protect kids, especially innocent families, from these wrong, repeated wrong raids? We can't have this. Um, what it does when we make mistakes, um, and particularly when we make mistakes uh, in the way in which we deal with your, our children, um, that, has, that leaves an indelible scar um, that is very, very difficult to repair those kinds of relationships. In the larger context, of the very, very sort of challenged relationship between the police department and the public generally, and the issues of trust or lack of trust, every one of these incidents is an aggravator and a perpetuator of this mistrust that exists. We the targets, black people. Even though we're black, doesn't mean they gotta do this to us. It's like people think all Mexican and blacks are bad, but they're thinking wrong. They feel that the police come in with no uh, sensibilities, with implicit bias in how they re relate to them. Dehumanizing, disrespectful, and I believe unlawful. How old are you, Deviana? Six. You know what it means to tell the truth? Yes. It means that you are telling the people what happened. So do you promise that you'll tell the truth? Yes. Very good. I am the videographer on May 15th, 2017, for the recording of the deposition of Daviana Simmons being taken at 219 South Dearborn Street. Do you know what a gun is? Yes. Do you know what it's used for? It's used to shoot. To shoot who or what? To shoot at people. Um, did the... Did the police point uh, a gun at anybody else in your house that they day? They pointed a gun at me. They pointed a gun at you? Yes? Yes. Can you tell me what you remember about that? That they put a gun in my chest. Can you tell me what the prayer is that you say before you go to bed? I pray that the police don't come back. I pray that everything is safe in my house. I pray that everything is safe, and I pray that I have good dreams in Jesus' name, amen. Because these officers are not trained on how to interact with young children, there's gonna be a lot more trauma. Other major departments, uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, uh, Charlottesville, San Francisco, Baltimore, they have trained their officers on how the youth brain works, how youth brains develop, and how officers should go out of their way not to expose young people, young children, to trauma. It should be part of the pre-raid plan to discuss exactly what you're going to do if you encounter children. I think we need to take those precautions to protect the things that happen to Peter does not happen to other children. Was there a, was there a personal consequence or, or an outcome that you learned about uh, after, there was no, after this day? There was no personal, um, I wasn't punished in any way. I wasn't you know, reprimanded or anything like that. Did anybody talk to you? about the investigation that you did? Um, no. Do you know that, like, when you met me, it was exactly one year ago today. Really? I looked at my calendar. I interviewed you on August 8th, 2018. Really? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I know that. The Inspector General has launched an investigation, and a law is being signed after your name. 
to protect children in raid situations. So, do you, are, you sense, are, you, are you understanding how important all this is? Yeah, very important. One year ago today. I can't believe it. Uh, I still have to smile, smile just because it's just a really big thing. Well, what are you gonna tell your friends? I, I don't really know. I'm just gonna say, not gonna brag about it or anything. I'm just gonna say, hey, um, look, so the governor signed the bill so that way every single kid or every single person that has been raided, wrong raids, has been protected. Just because there's a law doesn't mean they're gonna follow it sometimes. Because you, you got some people that care and you got some people that don't care. I was scared to use the bathroom by myself. I was scared to walk home by myself. I was scared to turn the lights off and go through the back door. That's how I got to therapy. I didn't like therapy at first, but I can now walk home by myself. I can use the bathroom and turn off the lights. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a cop. But now that that happened, I want to be a doctor. I am Peter Mendez. I am brave, I am smart, I am capable. Sometimes it gets sad, but I know how to work through it. Jim Williams here with Dave Savini. That was difficult viewing. You've been working on these stories for a year, and you've uncovered cases involving many other children who were not in this documentary. Yeah, these were just a few of the children and a few of the families. So far, we've examined cases ourselves of 23 different children that have gone through similar traumas, guns pointed at them, their parents handcuffed in front of them, and sometimes the children, as young as eight, put in handcuffs. I think we can all acknowledge that Chicago police officers have a very difficult job fighting crime in a violent city. They're going to have to do raids in some cases. How many raids do they do a year? They tell us they do several thousand raids a year, two to three thousand, maybe 3,500 raids in any one year. Do we have any idea how many of those raids are unwarranted? That's why we're doing the investigation. They refuse to turn over the records of all of the wrong raids. What do they tell you? The superintendent won't sit down like we're sitting down right here and answer questions from us. Although he did answer your questions in that news conference. If you want to go to a news conference and maybe get one or two questions out, he, he might answer you. I, I asked him right there at the podium. We've been asking for these records for, at that point, we had been asking for months. Now, we've been asking for over a year. And you've been enlisting the Illinois Attorney General's office. We had to go to the Illinois Attorney General's office to get them to force the Chicago Police Department to release a sliver of information. And in that sliver of information that we got, it doesn't make any sense. Our raids that we've been focusing on are missing. They're not in the documents. So where are the records? If we know those raids exist, why aren't those records in the records they're giving us? Dave, these police officers are required to wear body cameras, and we saw some of that footage. How important? Extremely, extremely important. People on the street have been saying this type of behavior has been happening for decades and longer. And they had no way to really fight back. It was a, it was a police officer's word versus their word. And what the body camera does is it, it brings the element of proof into the entire raid. You know, you have a recording of what's actually happening. Had there not been body cameras, we wouldn't have heard those officers whispering in the kitchen saying, we're in the wrong apartment. This is the wrong 
effing apartment. And then we wouldn't have seen that they continued to search an innocent family's apartment regardless. And when a child like Peter has to have therapy because of the trauma, who pays for that? Ultimately, in the end, Jim, we all end up paying for it because in the Daviana Simmons case, it settled for $2.5 million. That was the little girl. That was the little girl that testified that had the little prayer that she says before she goes to bed. So we have the police training, which doesn't but, exist, right. but there is a directive, a manual of sorts to explain how a raid should be conducted, correct? There is a directive, it's a manual, and it tells them what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to independently verify the information that the confidential informant or the John Doe or the Jane Doe gave them. There's a great cost to taxpayers because the city has had to pay the victims. But there's also broken trust, which hinders officers from fighting crime. Well, when any, any of these children go through a situation like this, their image of a police officer changes, their trust changes, and it will affect them throughout their life. They, they could become nervous. They may not want to call police when they need help because they've had a negative experience. But one of the things that families tell us is really the heart, one of the hardest parts of it is the humiliation they go through. You know, look at Peter. Peter had this entire raid happen in his house, but what does he remember other than the guns being pointed and his father in handcuffs? He remembers they didn't even shake his hand when they walked out. One guy did, but the other guys didn't. What's next? So since we started this documentary, we got contacted by another family, another wrong raid. We're working on that case, and we're gonna keep asking and fighting to get those records from the city on how often the wrong raids happen. Of course, we'll be interested to see what happens. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jim.